All right, it is 12.32, so let's get started. Are there any questions about anything that we've covered so far before I get started on the new stuff? No. Okay. Good. All right, I did change something in my uh, settings here at the, home, at the house, and I'm hoping that we will have better connectivity than we did the other day. People kept saying that I was bouncing in and out, that my voice and the video were both bouncing in and out, so hopefully this time today it won't happen. If it does, I would like to know. Please let me know if it does happen. So we're in the memory section and we're talking about different types of memory and how memory works and how, what a better way to remember things are. And I gave you 16 numbers that you, you had to be able to get all 16 of those numbers, but it was actually only four numbers. It was four dates that you already had in your brain if you had those experiences. If you're from a different country, you might not know 1776 in uh, Australia. Why would you need to know 1776 or 1812 if they weren't important dates in your country? But in our country, it is, they are important dates, and so you should know them already. They should be in your brain. Uh, so experience is absolutely required in order for us to be able to chunk, to be able to connect new material to old material we already have. And talked about maintenance rehearsal, which is just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And elaborative rehearsal, which is elaborating on that information, which means making a story up of some kind, um, that there is a cat and a dog and a horse and a car with a chair on it. Uh, and um, knowing, having a picture of that in order to remember five things in a row. The acoustic encoding is our ability to use the phonological loop for things that sound the same. We can remember things that sound the same easier because of the phonological loop. So it's the conversion of information to sound patterns and working memory. And more often, C, B, and D are mixed up in our brains rather than E and F. Even though E and F look the same, they don't sound the same. And so the phonological loop doesn't interfere with us in that respect, it, but C, B, and D, you might be thinking of somebody's name that starts with a B, but only the D names are coming up because you get stuck on that same sounding pattern. This is acoustic encoding. And the levels of processing theory says that there are, the way to remember things is to have many pathways to get to the data, and that spider web that you see here on the screen uh, wait, you're not seeing the spider web on the screen, are you? Hold on. Where are you? There you are. There we go. Spider web on the screen. Good. So this spider web shows if the piece of information you want is at the center of the spider web and you have all these different pathways to get to it, it is easier to find that information in your brain than if you only had one pathway to it. You, had to, you would have to find the correct pathway to get to that particular piece of information. But with all these other pathways, you just you access one pathway and it leads to that information. So you need to have lots of different processes, levels of processing in the ability to access the information. Connecting data together is very important. The more connections you have, the easier it is to recall the information. And of course, if you lose a particular pathway in the spider web, there's still plenty of other pathways to go. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you lose a pathway, you're, not, you're okay, but if you only have one pathway to get to that data, and that pathway is gone, that data is gone too. You're not going to be able to get back to it. So long-term memory has unlimited capacity, as we know, from 
our studies, we, we know that there's, as far as we can tell, all the data that we have is still there in our brain. It's just the pathways that are missing when we store something permanently. And there is some types of semi-permanent memory instead. But most of our memory that we keep for long periods of time are permanent memories. The semi-permanent ones come and go really rapidly. They don't seem to lay down a true memory pattern. So that has two subdivisions, the procedural memory and the declarative memory. The procedural memory is for things that you know how to do. I know how to talk, but it takes a lot of work to move my mouth, to move my chin, to move my tongue, to, to move my lips, to breathe properly in order to talk. There's a lot of procedures there. I know how to chew. Do not know how to chew to begin with. That's something that we learn how to do. And in Alzheimer's disease, procedural memory is the very last thing to go. It's a very strong memory. Once you know how to ride a bicycle, you know how to ride a bicycle. And it may take you a little bit to get back up on the bicycle again if you haven't picked it up in a long time. And I, I had not ridden a bicycle for 40 years. And then we adopted our little girl and bought her a bicycle. So I bought myself a bicycle too. And it didn't take very much time to get back up on the bike and start riding along with her around the neighborhood. So that's procedural memory. And then there's declarative memory, which is the division of long-term memory that is broken up into two pieces, semantic and episodic. And the semantic is knowledge and episodic is the emotions and the episodes that are associated with that particular knowledge. I know that I'm married, that's semantic memory, but I remember the actual experience of getting married, that's my, that's my episode. It can be transient or permanent. The transient is, doesn't get laid down very well. Uh, for instance, what did you have for breakfast a week ago? Unless you have breakfast the same every, every single week, then you probably don't know what you had breakfast. It, it's, it's not there. It just didn't lay down a permanent uh, memory. And then there's the permanent that stays forever. Once it's a permanent memory, it's there forever. And the pathway may be lost to it, but it's still there. So the episodic subdivision of a declarative memory is that stores memories for personal events or episodes in your life and the semantics in your knowledge, crystallized intelligence, it's called. The semantic memory seems to be uh, the middle type of memory. Episodic memory is the weakest memory. In Alzheimer's disease, episodic memory is the first to go. And if you don't have your episodes of life, well, then what is life? And if you can't lay down new memory, what is life? And I'm going to show you a video of a man who does not have the ability any longer to lay down new memories. This is the story of Clive Wearing. Now this is, he, he's in England, so you have to get used to the sound of the accent a little bit. And they say something like um, oh, encephalitis, they call encephalitis, uh, we call encephalitis, they call it encephalitis. And we play, how many of you play uh, solitaire? How many of you know how to play solitaire, the, the game with cards? You know how to play solitaire? Yeah, Catherine says she does. Anybody else know how to play solitaire? Hannah does. Are the rest of you there? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, in it, it, it takes a lot of patience to play, and that's exactly what they call it in England. They call it patience. That's the name of the game. And Will, he plays patience. He talks about being, playing patience. So you'll get used to the sound of the accent really rapidly, but at the very beginning of this movie, he's sitting on a park bench with his wife, and she says, do you know how we got here? And he's, I have no idea. It's a very sad life. I mean, for 38 years now, almost 40 years, he has woken up thinking it's a different day, a different time, a different era. 
and he has to be told what's happening to him. And it really doesn't matter if you tell him because 20 minutes, 20 seconds, 20 seconds later, he's forgotten. He knows some things. He remembers some things. Certainly he remembers how to talk. And that's a huge amount of information. That's procedural memory for how to talk. And it's also all the semantic memory of all that data of what a word means and how to put it together in a sentence. And he can do that very well. He also can dress himself. He can put his tie on. Uh, he doesn't remember whether he did or not without looking down and seeing if the tie is there. He can eat. He knows how to cut. He knows how to chew. He knows how to swallow. He knows, the, he knows his wife. He knows how to play a piano. Procedural memory is very, very strong. So you can, he can sit him down in front of a piano and he can play a song that's from memory. Like I can play chopsticks <laughs> after seven years of piano. Uh, but he can sit down and he can play a uh, piano and you can put a, a new piece of music in front of him that he's never seen before. And he can play it on the piano because all you need to know is what you, where you are to be able to play the next keys but he doesn't remember the beginning of it. 20 seconds later, after he started it, none of the stuff he started with is there anymore. He's just playing what's in front of him and continuing on. And what is life without the past episodes of our life? The episodes of his life are, he can't put down anymore. He can't put down any more semantic memory. He can't create new procedural memory but at least the stuff that was there is still there. He remembers his phone number from when he was a kid. So there are pieces of information that are still there, the old stuff, but he cannot put down any new information. It's like 50 First Dates. Have any of you seen the movie 50 First Dates? No's, lots of no's. Wow, very good movie about a, a, a girl who every time she goes to sleep, she forgets what day it is. And so she thinks it's the day she got, she was in an accident. And then she wakes up and everybody in her life has basically created an environment so that she never has to know that it's a different day. They've created an environment so she thinks, they, she thinks it's the next day. And she goes through the whole day remembering everything and then she goes to sleep and back to, where it was before. And that's not Clive Wearing, and that's not reality. But inside that movie, there was a man called 10 Second Tom who could remember anything for 10 seconds. And then he'd turn around, talk to you, say, hey, what's your name? Oh, okay. And then he turned around. You're not in his field of vision anymore. You're, his memory is disappearing slowly out of working memory. And 10 seconds later, he turned around. Oh, hey, what's your name? And that's Clive Wearing. So he has some major disadvantages in life, and it's because when your brain swells, which is what encephalitis is, the swelling of the brain, it can't expand. It's stuck within a hard bone shell, and if it starts swelling, then there's going to be pressure caused by the swelling, and the pressure is going to appear in the center of the brain. The hippocampus is in the center of the brain. It seems to be a fairly easily destroyed piece of mechanism because it's the first thing to go in Alzheimer's disease is episodic memory too. And so he's lost, he's lost his hippocampus. Remember, hippocampus is what, what creates 700 new neurons every single day, which is minimal compared to the 86 billion neurons we have when we're born, but it still may be how we put down new memories. We're still not really sure what memory is. We know it's associated with the brain, but we don't know exactly how it works yet. We can't describe it very well yet. Let me go back to our presentation. So he can play solitaire because solitaire doesn't matter. If you just come into a game and look at the game and there's a pile of cards next to it and you know how to play solitaire, you know, to play it from right, right where it is. It doesn't matter what happened beforehand. What matters is what's happening right now. He can watch a cricket game, or baseball for us, cricket, and it doesn't matter 
uh, what happened previously in the game because the score is up in the corner. So you can see what the score is and you can watch what happens when the pitch is made and it's 20 seconds is time frame enough time to see if the guy swings and hits the ball or not. And if he hits the ball, well, then he's running. You know that he hit the ball and 20 seconds later, you might not remember him hitting the ball, but you see him running. But he doesn't recognize the names of the teams because in the 38 years since he had his accident, the team's names have changed. His son says he's not really sure whether it was a good idea to save him. When he had encephalitis, we weren't sure what encephalitis was. We weren't sure how to fix it, how to, how to care for a person with encephalitis. They, they figured out with him how to save his life, but there's so much damage because it took him so long to figure it out. Today, if somebody gets encephalitis, we know exactly what to do to keep the person's brain intact so that they're not destroyed, but it's not destroyed by the disease, and then we can cure the disease, whatever it is that's causing the, the swelling, the encephalitis. But that's, that's the life of Clive Wearing. His wife set up the facility where he lives now. It's run by the government, but they didn't have one at first. They put him in an insane asylum. He's not insane. He's perfectly coherent person for 20 seconds, or he can keep something going in his head, right, for maintenance rehearsal, he can keep the maintenance rehearsal going, so she's there, he knows she's there, he's talking to her, he has access to his wife, he knows she's there, he might not remember when she got there, but it doesn't matter, he's talking to her, he's got, he's got his hands in, her hands in his hands, and that's enough. But is it really? Because when he leaves, 20 seconds later, he has no memory that she was there. That's got to be lonely. So long-term memory, this is a video, uh, sorry, this is a picture. This is a picture of long-term memory. Some of you are picture-oriented, so you see things in your head when you're taking your notes and when you're doing your tests. And this is a picture of it. Long-term memory can be broken down into two parts, declarative memory and procedural memory. The procedure is for things you know how to do. It's the strongest of all the, of the memory systems. It's the last thing to go in Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Declarative memory is the other side of it, and it can be broken down into semantic memory, which is your knowledge of facts, and the episodic memory, which is your episodes of life. So I know I'm married, it's a, it's a fact that I know, but it's just a fact. Without the, cement, without the episodic memory to associate with it, there's no real life given, no emotions that come along with the fact that I'm married. It's the episodic memories that give us, that, that make life worthwhile. And of course, episodics are the first to go in Alzheimer's disease. So we have a name for a memory trace, and it's called an engram, but we really don't know how it works. We don't know how it begins. We don't know why one, P, one neuron decides to be the trace for that particular memory. Uh, we know that the hippocampus creates all these 700 new neurons every day, and maybe that's 700 things we can learn every single day. But with some research now today, we find that there are two memory systems. There's one that start at the exact same time. One of them becomes your permanent memory. The other one uh, may or may not maintain itself and it disappears. So if I'm thinking if this one just disappears, then the permanent memory never gets made. It's transient at that point. And, this, and as they're growing, if this one continues to blossom, then this one becomes your permanent memory. Some research is showing that but we're not really sure why and how memory is created yet. We know it's diffuse, it's all over the brain. It's not like a particular area like the motor cortex is. So the physical trace of memory is called an engram. We're still unsure of the complete picture of an engram. We do know that we can lose the ability to make these new traces, and we know we can lose the ability to retrieve them as well. 
When events are emotionally charged and contain an element of personal interest, the encoding of the engram is actually made very easily, uh, though it's not as accurate when we recall it as we, as we would imagine. And this is called a flashbulb event or flashbulb memory. And scientists think that flashbulb memories occur when the amygdala is engaged in the creation of the engram. The amygdala is, is a part of our emotion system. It's, uh, very, it's associated with fear, and it's associated with anger. And anyone who watched the Twin Towers fall on television during 9-11 can remember every single thing, every detail about that particular event, where they were, what time it was, uh, what the weather was like, who was with them, the smells sometimes, even the sounds around them. So they can remember a great deal of information because it's a light bulb, flash bulb event. We have different types of amnesia. Clyde Wearing has what's called enterograde amnesia. He can't put down new memories. It's the inability to form new memories, just like I said, 50 first dates. The amygdala and the hippocampus are critical in placing and retrieving memories, and the loss of either one means you will not be able to place new memories. So it is, memory is associated with specific areas, very specific areas of the brain, but where those memories end up in your brain, there's no, no idea why. Once we know why a memory ends up in a specific location or how to retrieve a specific memory, especially how to retrieve a memory, then Elon Musk's little gadget, you can put the entire contents of the Library of Congress on a chip, stick it into your head, tie it into your memory system, and you will have the entire contents of the Library of Con Congress. You will know everything that's in that building. But that's not intelligence. <laughs> that's just knowledge. If you don't know how to use the knowledge, then what's the use of having all the data? Now, so schools will, if this is true, if this is what actually happens, then you'll be born, you'll be given all this knowledge. Schools will not be about accumulating knowledge. It'll be about how to use the knowledge that you know. So retrograde amnesia is the loss of old information. He had most of his old information was intact. He still had that. Uh, so retrograde amnesia is the inability to remember information previously stored in memory. This might be because the pathways are destroyed or the memory itself may have been destroyed if there was accident done to the brain or pathology, um, path pathological aging, which would mean you're taking drugs or you're uh, alcoholic and you lose that memory. Now, if the memory isn't permanently lost, it does get it does come back, and most times retrograde amnesia, especially in the young, when you fall down, hit your head, and oh, you can't remember where you live or what your phone number is, that does happen, but it is temporary and it comes back after a while, sort of like your brain is re rebooting. It does not happen that a person just loses their memory, something has to happen to the brain, and it isn't like the Bourne Identity movies where uh, where he was shot in the back twice, boom, boom, shot in the back, fell off of a ship into the ocean, and then somebody recovered his body. He was still alive and brought him back, and he couldn't remember anything about his life. No, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't get shot and lose your memory. Now, if he had gotten shot, fell off the boat, and there was a log floating by, and as he fell into the water, he smacked his head on the log, well, yeah, then he hurt his brain, and yeah, then he would have a problem uh, remembering who he was, but only for a short period of time, not for the huge amount of time that it took him to get through figuring out who he was in The Born Identity. Another good movie if you have a chance to see it. Uh, neuroscience and, and long-term memory are connected. The cerebellum seems to be to control learning of elementary reflexes, the procedural memories that we have, and memories learned through repetition and classical conditioning. So. Uh, very much, uh, it's probably the habits of your life as well. That's the cerebellum. Changes do occur in the brain, in the neurons and synapses when memory occurs. We can watch this in, in amoebas, in really elementary uh, animals, organisms. 
if uh, you can actually see under a microscope the animal moving around and you can see its neuron today, you can see the neurons that it has in electron microscopes as it's moving around. And if it learns something new, if you give it something that's unknown to it before, uh, then its neurons, its synapses start to change. So we know that there's something there, we're just not sure exactly why and how it happens. So as I said, we don't create many new neurons. We create 700 new neurons a day, which is minimal. Um, but we make dendrites and we make axons and we connect those that we do have together in certain ways. Why does one connect to another one? I don't know, and I'm not sure that biologists at this point know why one neuron decides it's going to be a part of this particular memory and connect to a different uh, pathway so that you have multiple pathways. I'm not even sure that they have any idea how that happens yet. Uh, Long-term potentiation is a thing that we know about neurons, that if you use a neuron over and over and over and over again, it becomes really easy to fire off, which makes it a habit. If that neuron fires off, it fires off and connects to a whole bunch of other neurons. It has neurons connecting to it. Remember the axiom, when neurons fire together, they wire together. So when a neuron pathway is activated, it becomes much easier to activate for a few days afterwards. And if you continue to activate it, it gets easier and easier to activate. And it connects to more and more other neurons. So whether memories are implicit or explicit, the success of their retrieval depends on how they were encoded and how they are cued. My, in normal cases, when I'm sitting in a classroom teaching, I know my students from that classroom. That's where they are sitting in the classroom. That's how they were encoded. I encode your name by where you're sitting in the classroom. And then they're cued when I come into the classroom and you're sitting in that location. Ah, that's a cue. There it is right there. That's who you are. I know your name. But if I see you in a food lion, I know I know you, but I'm not really sure who your name, what your name is or why I know you. Your face is familiar, but why, who are you? And then I remember, oh, you're in my class. Wait, it's a current class, which means it's one of these, oh, you're sitting in that seat. Ah, your name is George. So there are two different types of uh, memory we can discuss, and that's implicit memory and explicit memory. Implicit memory is memory that has not been deliberately learned. If you close your eyes right now and I ask you a particular question, you would probably be able to answer that question even though you hadn't purposefully tried to remember that particular information. It just, it's there, it floats into your brain. So what is the outline uh, color of my windowsill? You know, and you would be able to tell me. Most of you would say pink because it looks pink to me, but, uh, there's all kinds of ways that your computer can change that color. So it's not necessarily pink on your screen, but it is uh, a pink outline. Uh, explicit memory is the type of memory that you purposefully try to learn so that you can remember it. Now, I can prime you to remember certain things, and I tried to do that with the War of 1812. If you remember, I gave you the 16 numbers, but before that, I had talked about the War of 1812 because 1812 was the last four digits in that 16 string of numbers, and if you recognized that was, a, that was 1812, wait, he just talked about, eight, that's a date. Are the rest of them dates? And yeah, there were only four actual dates that you had to remember not 16 numbers, and that makes chunking easy. But priming is to give you the information ahead of time so that you would purpose, you would easily, more easily, remember the information or be able to chunk the information. Remember, if you don't have data, you can't chunk. If you don't know the War of 1812, if you're not from the United States, and there's no reason to remember the War of 1812, of in Australia, why would they need to know the, the year 1812 or the year 1776? So here in the United States, it's something that we know and we keep track of. So 
I can prime you by having you say certain words over and over again, like mop, drop, flop, mop, drop, flop, mop, drop, flop, mop, drop, flop, mop, drop, flop. What do you do at a green light? And most of you will say stop, but that's not what you do at a green light. <laughs> you go. That's correct, Lauren. <laughs> you go. But if I, if I had gotten you to say those words over and over again, you would most likely have said stop because it's a priming. So priming can be good and it can get in our way at the same time. Just like the phonological loop is good, but it can get in our way at the same time. Uh, I can prime you by showing you a whole bunch of, of words and have you just sort of go over those words a few, for a few minutes so that you, re you recognize the words and then take the words away and um, about half an hour later show you a couple other words and you would be more easily identify the ones that you had seen How? because you were primed to. And you will also more easily be able to fill in the words that have spaces in them if they were the ones that you had seen before. But what's interesting about that is that we, we know the word ninja, and our brain has been primed for assassin, but ninja is a word that we know connects to assassin, and so we might think we had seen the word ninja when, in fact, we had not. We had instead seen the word uh, assassin. So priming, priming can help, but it can also hinder. There was a good example of this in a research that was done where college students were shown very specific pictures. They were shown a picture of a grocery store, the outside of the grocery store. They were shown a picture of the inside of the grocery store. They were shown a picture of the orange, a, a display of oranges. They were shown a display of oranges that were all over the floor. They were shown a display, uh, they were shown a, a old lady with a cart coming into the grocery store, and they were shown an old lady with a cart coming out of the grocery store full of oranges. This is about six or seven pictures. The next day they were shown about 30 pictures and told to pick out the ones that they had seen before. And they were easily, they easily picked out the ones that they had seen before, but they also picked out the one picture that was put in there as a primer um, that got in their way, and that was the picture of the old lady with her shopping cart hitting the oranges and knocking them over. And they picked that one as if they had seen it because it fits the pattern. It fits a, a storyline. And our brain wants to put together a storyline. Our memory is an outline. And when we bring up that outline, then we fill it in with all kinds of data that may not actually have been there. So that was a really cool research. We know that there are two different kinds of, re of remembering, recall and recognition. And I ask you, how many of you say yes if you prefer multiple choice over fill in the blank? Say yes if you prefer multiple choice over fill in the blank. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> There's no no's. I don't see any no's. <laughs> of course, we prefer our, our recognition type of memory because we don't have to have a very strong rec memory, but when something is shown to us, we can recognize it but we can't pull it up from our head and recall because it's not there very strongly. So we like multiple choice because we see, a, we see a question with a whole bunch of answers. And we, oh, I recognize that answer. And so we pick the answer we recognize. We couldn't do it without the answers being there. And again, it gets in our way because we see an answer. We go, oh, oh, I know that answer. That's that. It is. It absolutely is an answer. It's just not the answer to that question that was asked. So that gets in our way as well because we don't know the information very well. And I'm not here to make to, to tell you to, to know it very well, but if you can do the crossword puzzles that I gave you, that's fill in the blank. That's, a, that's like a fill in the blank. I give you a little bit of data, and then you have to come up with the answer yourself. And if you can do that, then you have that information. That information is yours. When you can recall data, 
then it's a strong pathway and it's probably multiple pathways to that data. And so you don't lose it because of a transient pathway that hasn't been established very well yet. You've got a lot of other pathways to get to it. That's recall. Recognition, it, you, need, you need to activate that pathway by recognizing something in your environment. The encoding specificity is uh, that we can retrieve data if we're in the location where we encoded the data, like knowing your name when I'm in the, in the room with you sitting in your seats. If you meet one of your professors in the drugstore, you may not remember his or her name because you're not in the class where you learned that name and your professor may remember your face but will have trouble remembering your name because you aren't in the seat where she or he learned your name. I remember back to the spider web with only one path or one encoded route to help remember. It's difficult to get the information from memory. And if there's a match between your encoding, how you learned it, and your retrieval, it's easier to recall the item uh, is because you're not really recalling it, you're recognizing it because something in the environment is triggering it. So it's really a recognition memory, not a recall memory. Tip of the tongue is when there's something that you know oh my gosh, I know this word and I cannot get it out. And I'm a very sarcastic person. So when my wife says, well, it's on the tip of my tongue, I'll say, stick your tongue out. I'll read it from your, you know, it's like, it's not on the tip of your tongue. It's not written right there on the tip of your tongue. It's not coming out of Wernicke's area. It's stuck in Wernicke's area. It won't come through Wernicke's area to come out of your mouth. And it, it, its effects are sort of, humorous to those people who are watching, but not very humorous to the person who it's happening to. And the harder you try, it seems, the worse it is. You just cannot get it. So you go to sleep, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, you wake up, and, oh, I got it. I know the answer. Oh, thank God, I know the answer. When I wake up in the morning, I'll fill out that, you know, take it home homework that I was supposed to do. And, no, don't. Don't do that. Get up and write it down on the homework now because if you go to sleep and you wake up again at 5 o'clock, you're not going to remember it. Our memory is that bad. <laughs> write it down or have some kind of recorder next to your bed so you can record the information when, you, when you're thinking about it. Then you can go back to sleep because it's there. You've got it. <clears throat> so many times you remember at 2 o'clock when you forgot it even, you even cared about it. You didn't even know your brain's still working on it. It is possible that similar sounding words because of the phonological loop are, and phrases are interfering with remembering or you just don't have the correct starting syllabus maybe. And the harder you think about it, it seems the harder it is to remember the information. State dependent learning is learning that is associated with a particular state of being and that includes being on drugs as well as uh, your emotional state. So state dependent learning occurs when your body connects the memory with a specific state. If you are not in that state, again, when you attempt to remember it, you will have difficulty remembering it. So aside from the tip of the tongue syndrome and state-dependent learning, most of our memory problems arise from the memory seven sins. And we'll talk about those in a minute. That evolutionary psychologists believe that the seven sins of memory are really byproducts of otherwise adaptive features that our ancestors needed for some reason or another. But the uh, state-dependent learning, I would say, state-dependent learning, I like to use interns, medical interns, to describe this because you graduate from medical school and then you go to be an intern. And you have a three-day, 72 hours, you're up and you have to be on call. You're at the hospital. You are not at your home. You are living at the hospital for three days. You are not allowed out of the hospital you are supposed to be there on call. And yeah, they have a little bed for you, but who has time if it's a busy hospital, you don't have time, you're up and you're moving around all the time. So a lot of interns, they were on speed in, in order to stay awake. While they're learning, they've learned how to do something, but it's still not muscle memory. You, you, you can't do it without thinking about it. You still have to think about it. You still have to get it done and you're on speed. And so if I had to have something done to me back in the day when uh, I, by an intern, 
I want to make sure they're on speed so they know what they're doing because they're in a state dependent learning at that point. It hasn't become routine yet for them. They're still laying down the memories and they're laying down the memories in a particular state. So I want them in that state when they're trying to remember it too. So let's look at the seven sins of memory. Uh, transience, active mindedness, blocking, misattribution, suggestibility, bias, and persistence. So transience is the fact that our memory system is not perfect and the pathways disappear. And like I said, now they think there are two different pathways that come at the same time. And if one of them doesn't flourish, then the other one dies and both of them die. But if one flourishes, then the other one takes a hold and then this one disappears and this one is the one that's the actual memory. So the impermanence of long-term memory, long-term memories gradually fade in strength because of the pathway dying and the recall traces disappear rather than the actual memory itself for, for the permanent types of memories. Transient long-term memories are, are not permanent, they're transient. Uh, you can remember them for a day or so. What did you have for breakfast on Monday? Well, unless you have the exact same thing every Monday, you probably don't know unless there's only two or three things that you actually have. Uh, so you don't remember what it was that you had. You know you, what it might be <laughs> because I only eat three things, so it's got to be one of those three things, but I don't remember Monday. I don't even remember yesterday's meal. So permanent memories never disappear during brain surgery. We know this because the patient can agree to help map the brain, and it is diffuse all over the memory system. It's not like the motor cortex, which all people have in exactly the same spot. A memory of a cat that I have, a pet that I have, is not in the same location as the memory of the pet that you have. Brain stimulation can bring back memories long forgotten during these surgeries. The, in transients, what we want to know is how long does it take for a memory to disappear? And this is something that you can use for the rest of your college education. For the rest of your time that you're in college, you'll be able to use this information to help you. It's called the, the relearning time. It was done by Ebbinghaus. Ebbinghaus actually tested himself, which is really a stupid thing to do. You have too much bias about yourself. But he came up with this idea of the learning curve and the, um, what, what he called the uh, relearning curve. So this is an evaluation of how much you know and how much you forget and how long it takes you to remember it again. Now, although he did it on himself, this has been tested on thousands and thousands of people and it seems to be correct in what he found and this is the curve. So what he did was he took phrases or words that had no relationship to each other or just letters or anything that he could just put together and try to memorize it memorize that information. When he knew a certain amount of it, he would then wait, stop, and he would come back a day later to see how much he knew, and a day later after that, see how much he knew, and a day later after that, and keep track of how much he lost. Well, from the very first day, his loss was tremendous loss, a tremendous loss. But by day five, the loss, what he knew five days ago that he still knows five days later, it doesn't seem to go, it, it's there and for a month, and you can see from the curve it does not go down very rapidly. So anything you have studied that you know, that you have stopped studying and five days later you still know it, you're going to know it for the test. Don't worry about it. Don't waste your time trying to learn stuff you already know. If you know it five days later, you still you will know it 30 days later, and you need to study the stuff you forgot. That's the, that's the cue here, the clue. Don't waste your time studying stuff you already know. Now, you lose it in a day. The next day, you're going to lose a lot too. So wait for five days after you study something, then test yourself. Do I, how much do I know? The stuff I know? I don't have to worry about it. I can push it aside. The stuff I don't know, that's the stuff I need to wor worry about and spend time on. You, d you only have a certain amount of time in a day. You've got to sleep. You've got to work. You've got to 
take care of the house. You, you, there's a whole host of things besides schoolwork that you have to take care of. So don't waste your time on stuff you already know. Absent-mindedness is forgetting because you just didn't pay attention. And uh, the next one is blocking. But how many of you remember what the last one was? Because you weren't paying attention? Absent-mindedness, forgetting because you have lapses in attention. You're not paying attention. That's absent-mindedness. We don't pay attention all the time. 15 minutes after I started this, uh, this lecture, you're already thinking about what you're going to have for dinner, the date you're going to have, whether you're going to go out to the restaurant or not, whether you're going to um, tempt fate and, and find out whether you have COVID or not two weeks later. You're thinking about all these things, not thinking about what it is I'm talking about. Some of you turned it on, turned on the, uh, got uh, connected to the lecture and then just left. And I know because when we leave, there are two or three of you that don't leave. Like when the class is over, it's quite obvious you're not there. <laughs> so uh, that's absent minus not paying attention. So blocking occurs in numerous ways. We are, uh, I've already talked about the phonological loops gets in the way and we've, we can't get a word out because the phonological loop is giving us the, a different syllable starting or sound starting that like D instead of B. Uh, but there are other ways that we're, our memories are blocked also. There's proactive, retroactive, and the serial positioning effect. The proactive interference is when information you already know interferes with learning new information. And retroactive interference is learning new information that interferes with the old information. I can give you a great example of this because I took both French and Spanish in high school. My freshman and sophomore years, I took French. I did not like it. I still don't like French very much. I remember how to say, assez-vous and fermez les bouches, which is sit down and shut your mouth, which is what I was told most of the time while I was in French. And, um, then I, for my junior and senior years, I took Spanish, which I loved. I, th I thought Spanish was much easier than French was. But when I was, when I was taking Spanish, and we'd get a test, down, and I'd start writing the test in, and then I'd look back and go, oh, man, that's a French word, not a Spanish word, right? That's when information you already know interferes with learning new information. I was putting down French words instead of Spanish words, so it was the French was interfering me, with me learning new stuff. But once I learned the Spanish, then when I was talking to somebody in French, Spanish words would come out. So I, I, it was, that's called retroactive interference. You, all I'm trying to get French and I'm getting Spanish instead. Very, that's exactly what proactive and retroactive interference are about. A uh, serial positioning effect is another thing that you should know because this will help you for the rest of your college career, and it is also called the primacy recency effect. When learning new information in a list, you can only remember the first and last items and you forget the middle items. So if you're remembering the states, the, na the names of all 50 states and our, um, and our protectorates also, so what is that? 53 um, all together. So we have, um, we have Samoa, Guam, and um, Puerto Rico also, which could be states if they wanted to, um, and if the Senate and House would let them. But they are protectorates. So we have 53, and you're trying to remember them all in a, in a row, because they usually put them in alphabetical order, so you just remember the alphabet, alphabetical order. But as you're learning it, you always start with the first and go to the last. Start with the first and go to the last. Start with the first and go to the last. And according to the serial positioning effect research, you remember the first things, you remember the last things, and you don't remember what's in the middle. And you just keep on hitting your head against this wall because you continue to try to learn it the same way all the time. First one to the last one. And what the serial positioning effect tells us is, don't learn it all the time from the first to the last. Sometimes start in the middle and go around to the last and come back to the first and back around again to the middle. And then the first and the last that you studied are in the middle instead of on the ends. Change up the way you study. 
don't always study the same way and look to the research to figure out the best way to study. Misattribution is a faulty memory that occurs when memories are retrieved, because it's an outline, we retrieve the memories, but they're associated with the wrong time, place, and person. <laughs> so, <laughs> have any of you ever dated someone and broke up with them and dated somebody else and called the new one by the old person's name? <laughs> <laughs> say lots of roses, lots of roses. Um, I, before I met my wife, the last girlfriend that I had was named Jan. I, I dated her for uh, a number of years. And then I met my wife, Jane. I've never made that mistake. I have never made that mistake. But I have friends who know both Jan and Jane, and they make the mistake. But they're not the ones that get into trouble. I'm the one who gets into trouble because my wife says, I never should have been dating Jan in the first place. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the times you might say, oh, that movie's coming back to the movie theater. Remember when we just went to see this movie? We need to go see this movie again. And then, I have never seen that movie. Who did you go to see that movie with? <laughs> so, lots of roses, lots of roses. That's misattribution. Suggestibility is a process that can be done either purposefully or inadvertently. So, people can purposely try to um, create a suggested memory in you, or it can be inadvertent. Children do not know the difference between reality and fantasy. They do not know the difference. If you give them a picture in their head, they cannot tell you whether it actually happened or not. And this is called suggestibility. Children do not know the difference between reality and fantasy, and this happened in Edenton, North Carolina, in the Little Rascals case, which was a daycare, and somebody declared that the children in the daycare were being abused sexually, and so the idiot social worker and police officer that went in to investigate gave the children a, a, a suggestion. They basically said, how are these people touching you between your legs? That child now has a picture of adults picture, touching them between their legs and have no concept of the difference between reality and fantasy. They can't separate them. And so because of, the, because of that, the trial Basically, they all got off. Only one person went to jail, and that person ended up getting off because of this very, this very reason. So it produces um, misinformation based on data that's being given to you. A police officer who is trying to get information from a witness might say, did you see the red light? That is never the question. You should never say that. You're trying, you have to ask leading questions, but you just gave that person the memory of a red light. And the fact that this can happen to you can also um, be helped by telling the person that this might happen. I, as a police officer, have to ask me certain questions, and that police officer had better be trained in how to ask these questions. It, you should Ask questions in a very specific way so that it does not lead to memory errors. But you do have to ask leading questions. And if you tell the witness, I'm going to ask you questions, and they might change your memory of the situation. So I want you to remember what it is. Don't let me change your memory. Well, then the witness is going to clamp down on that memory because they know there's a possibility they might, for, might somehow be misinterpret what they saw. So now you have a better chance of getting the actual data out of that person. So fabricated memories and even recovered memories. People go into hypnosis to remember things. It's still, you have to ask the questions properly. If you don't, in hypnosis, you are very suggestible. And we'll talk about hypnosis in the states of mind section, states of consciousness. You are extremely suggestible, so you could get all of this information um, given to you by the person who's asking the questions while you're in hypnosis. So 
there's a problem with recovered memories that way too. And all of this leads to eyewitness errors, which is why when you see something happen, the police officers want your statement right now, right, right away. They want it written down, and they want your signature at the end of it. Is this what you saw? Yes, then write your signature. Thank you. When it comes to court and you happen to be a witness of it, a year later, when you are, well, if you are asked at that point a year later to remember what it is that happened, you bring up that outline and all the memories for the last year are all coming up with it. All the people that have, you have talked to about it, the, the television shows that have talked about it, your relatives who have talked about it, the magazines and newspapers you've read about it, all of that data is coming up and all of those pundits have their own views and all those views are coming up too and it's not very useful information at that point. So in the court, they give you the piece of paper and they say, is this your signature? Yeah. Is this your statement? Yeah, read it to the court, because that's the most pure example of your witness. So recollection, recollections are less influenced by leading questions if the possibility of memory bias is forewarned. If you tell the person, this might change your memory, so please don't let it. The passage of time, of course, leads to increases in misremembering information. Age, sex, race, uh, culture, all of that changes the way that we see the world. Uh, witness, eyewitness testimony, if I see a, something happen, if I'm Catholic and I see something happen and there happens to be a priest in there, I recognize the priest and immediately center on that priest. If I am Jewish and I see and there's a rabbi, I will immediately center on the rabbi. If I'm African American, there's only one African American in the group, I will center on the African American. If I'm a woman, there's a woman in the group, I'll center on the woman. Or if I'm a man, the man or a child, the child. We look at those things that are that mean something to us, that have some kind of meaning to us. And that means that we're not seeing the entire picture of the event. We're seeing it from a particular perspective. And if a person is banging on the counter saying, I know what I saw, I don't think they know anything. They're trying to convince themselves, not me. So confidence in memory, uh, I know what I'm saying, that's not a sign of accuracy. Just because you think you know what you saw, no. In fact, the, the more you yell, the less I think you know. Bias is an attitude, belief, emotion, or experience that distorts our memory. Mood congruent memory is a bias. Mood, your mood. If you're happy, you remember happy things. It's hard to remember sad things. And if you're sad, it's hard to remember happy things. So uh, it's, very, it's almost equivalent to dependent, state-dependent learning. What, what state you were in when you, remember, when you learned it is, or when it happened to you is the best way to remember it. Self-consistency is the bias that most of us get in trouble with, and that is we don't like to be wrong. We want to be correct. And it is easy to remember things that confirm our belief structure. If something happens and it's like, yep, I, yep, I could have predicted that, it's exactly what I expected, then I'm going to easily remember that thing. We remember those things that, are, that confirm our beliefs. And we forget those things that do not conform to our belief structure. Or we say that they, we give them less credit. Yeah, that, yeah, sure, that is actually what happened. But it doesn't really matter because that's, it, it, it's less important than what really is important. Okay? My beliefs <laughs> and my being correct. So when our actions and beliefs conflict, we get a particular state called cognitive dissonance, which we will talk about in Chapter 14. But if, if I have morals and ethics, I have a list of morals and ethics in my head. This is the way I'm supposed to behave. And then I behave a specifically different way that contradicts what I believe. There's a conflict between the two, and it creates what we call cognitive dissonance. We'll talk about that in Chapter 14, the last chapter. Persistence is when we have a particular issue that just, it's, it's so bad. We have an accident, car accident, and we, that memory of that car accident just will not go away for a month. 
it just keeps coming up and up and we're going over it and over it and we can't get rid of it. We want to forget it, let it go away already and it just keeps coming back. That's persistence. And because it's there, it gets in the way of us learning new things. So neuroscientists have shown that the brain changes when we create new memories and if those changes are strong enough, then it may be difficult to reduce those neural pathways. They persist over and over again and they become so persistent that we're unable to think of anything else. And that's persistence. It gets in the way. We can improve our memories, but um, I'm almost done with the class here. So I'm just going to stop here. I got, what, two more slides. I'll finish those slides when we come back on Thursday and start the next unit. If there's anything that you need to talk about, stay and talk with me. Uh, if not, then I'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a great day and stay healthy. Bye.